I'd like to read a few verses from Genesis chapter 1, beginning with verse 26. This is our second sermon in a brand new series on the book of Genesis. We looked at the first 25 verses last week. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created him. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now skip over to chapter 2 and look at verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Let's pray. Holy Spirit of God, you are hovering over this place. Would you find any heart that is empty by the Lord Jesus Christ? And would you convict them of their need for you? And would you convict us of our sin where we have wandered away? Father, may this word come in power. We, we want the form of godliness, but more than that, we, you tell us that, that the form that's devoid of power is, is empty. And so we pray that you would come in power. Convict us. Shape us into your image that we would more and more look like Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I was boasting this week about how good I felt. I've been taking Dr. Sinatra's uh, energy pills and I uh, hadn't been sick for a long time. Sure enough, I get the, get the throat again. So uh, pray for me that I will be able to get through. Genesis chapter 1 has been a battleground for a long time. Since the emergence of science and evolution, there has been a battle over origin. How did, the, how did our universe come to be? The importance of Genesis 1 is found in the fact that our eternal God, who is before all things, created the world out of nothing for his own good pleasure. The second part of Genesis, the one is that man is unique. Our existence is not the result of evolution. That battle, sad to say, has not just been against science or evolution. Uh, that battle has also been waged among Christians when it comes to one aspect of Genesis 1. And before I get into what I read, I'm going to go down a side road with you. That battle is over the length of the days of creation. There are several views that have been put forth, and I want to briefly mention a few. And each of these views has some strengths and weaknesses. No view adequately addresses all of the unanswered questions raised in chapter 1. One view came along in the early 1800s, espoused by a man named Thomas Chalmers, and it is called the recreation theory or the gap theory. God made a beautiful world in verse 1 of Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Between verse 1 and 2, something happened. Something awful happened. Satan, before he was Satan, was an angel who was given charge of the world. And when he led a rebellion against God, he and the world were cursed. He was the angel that was given charge over this world, and he was cast out, and the world became formless and void. God gives us lots of time 
for all the prehistoric ages to pass. And it gives a convenient explanation for the evil that is lurking and the appearance of Satan as a serpent in chapter 3. And then God steps in at verse 3 and he recreates. And God said, let there be life. And the earth bears the mark of antiquity as it is now remade by God. This view was held by people like Donald Barnhouse, C.S. Lewis, Arthur Pink, and Francis Schaeffer. The second view is called the, the Long Day Theory. Now what is that? Well, Genesis 1 is talking about six distinct events. The days are not regular 24-hour days, but long periods of time that, that seem to correspond with the scientific timetable and allows for a much older Earth. The day is a period of time. Charles Hodge from Princeton, Edward J. Young from Westminster, and Laird Harris from Covenant Seminary held to this view, and so did the uh, preacher and author uh, Jim Boyce, pastor at Tenth Press. The third view is the 24-hour day view, which is the oldest and best attested. It simply takes the words uh, day and translates it as a 24-hour day. The evening and the morning signify a 24-hour period. That's taken hold more recently in, uh, since the advent of Whitcomb and Mars and the Creation Research Council. The days are literal, the earth is young, creation has the appearance of age, but it is not as old as people think, perhaps 12,000 years. And in this view, most of the fossils were laid during the cataclysmic flood of about 10,000 years ago. Now these two views, the long day and the 24-hour views, are most popular in our denomination. And we should certainly, if we disagree, never question someone's orthodoxy on these matters if we are seeking to be faithful to the Word of God. The important thing is not when did it happen. It is enough that it was in the beginning. Or how long it took. But who made it? God certainly could have made it in a second. In fact, Augustine believed that, it, that creation didn't take seven days. It was instantaneous. Now, the second matter that's crucial as we get into the text is this matter that man is separate and a unique creation of God. That means that we did not morph from an enzyme into a tadpole or to a monkey and then to a man. We are formed from the dust of the ground as a distinct creation. God breathes into Adam the breath of life, the Holy Spirit's breath of God, and he becomes a living soul. And I mentioned last week that this is one of the pillars of a Christian world and life view. In fact, I mentioned about eight of them, and the fact is that four of these pillars that, that, that are the gateway to understanding all of Scripture are found in the first two chapters of Genesis. It helps to answer the question, who am I? Why am I here? And does God care about me? These four huge foundational principles in the first two chapters of Genesis 1 begin with the fact that I am a unique creation. God formed the man out of the dust of the earth and he breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living soul. I'm a unique creation. But more than that, God has given me a unique calling. Fill the earth and subdue it and rule over it. The cultural mandate. And this is followed by a unique day, the, the Sabbath day. God rested from all of his work on the seventh day and blessed that day. And, and that, that too is a part of our Christian world and life view. And that's followed then at the end of chapter 2 by a unique relationship. God brings Eve before him. A man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two become one flesh. And in subsequent sermons, we're going to look at this unique day and this unique marriage relationship 
as it comes out of the Word of God. But for now, we're just going to talk about the first two, that unique creation and that unique calling, and the two stand together. And here's, here's the core teaching of this passage. We are uniquely designed by our Creator to have a relationship with Him, to reflect His character, and to have dominion over His world, all to the praise of Jesus Christ. The word create is used three times throughout chapter 1, and then when you get to verse 26, he uses the word three times. Double the amount of usage. Why is that? This is important. This highlights the man and woman as the crown of creation. God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. He saves the best for last. All other acts of creation are the, are the opening acts. And this is the main event. Now let's look at the image of God in man. What does it mean? There's something about us that is different from the animals. They are wonderful, and all of you who have pets, tell me how wonderful they are. But they do not bear the image of God. Three times we read that the creatures brought forth according to their kind. In other words, they look like the people, the animals that produce them. But the language of man's creation is that they are created after the image of God. We say of a baby, he is the spitting image of his father. Yesterday I was looking at a picture of my first grade class at Willow Grove Christian Day School taken right out here when it was meeting at Calvary Church. And in that picture was my favorite teacher, Penny Pappas, who was a member of this church for a long time. She was 30 and she was beautiful. But the important thing is she had her arm around my shoulder because I was her favorite student. <laughs> Everybody knows that. And in the front row was somebody that some of you know, uh, Rebecca Clowney Jones. She was sitting in the first row. She is um, Miriam Herzog's um, mother and Aiden's grandmother. And when you look at the picture of Rebecca Clowney Jones as a six-year-old first grader, it looks like Aiden. The, uh, Miriam's son Aiden with, with pigtails and a dress. <laughs> and it's uncanny. And we, you know, we just, we, we, had to, we had to really laugh, you know. She, she wanted, Miriam wanted a daughter. You know, that's what the daughter would, would look like. The, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You see, there's this gene pool. And it might skip a generation, but there's, there's this image. You look into their eyes and you see somebody else, you see. Um, well, we're, we're, the spit, we're the spitting image of our Father. There's a spiritual, a moral gene pool. When God created us, He made us like Him. There's something about Him that people can see in each other. Okay, now, in the ancient Near East, it was common for kings to be thought of as ruling on behalf of the gods that they served. And so the kings were called an image of God. To see the ruler was to see the God of that culture. The king would, was supposed to learn the mind of the God and then carry it out. Well now the Hebrew perspective is quite different. It's not the king who bears the image and rules in God's place. Every one of us is in his image. We find out who we are in relationship to God and we carry out His purposes. All of us are valuable and significant in God's eyes and we should consider every human being with dignity and with honor, whether they are whole or handicapped, sick or well, poor or rich, black or white, slave or free, young or old, born or unborn, a world-class athlete, or a person on life support. And the next time you want to demean 
judge, criticize, or say something unkind, remember, you are looking into the face of a child of God. What is this image? When we think of the image of God, we're not talking about our physical appearance, for God has no body. We think of the image in two ways. There is a broad understanding and there is a narrow understanding. In the broad sense, we are able to think. We are able to communicate. We are able to reason, to love. We are able to create. There's a sense of immortality that we were meant for something more than just ending up in the, in the grave. God's put eternity in our hearts. We have this God consciousness. We have the sense of, of right and wrong. And everybody has that. These are the things that God gives to everyone. But in the narrow sense, the image of God is defined as knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. In other words, we were made to know God, and in a sense to know ourselves, who we are in relationship to Him. Uh, we were made to do what is morally right. And you know, the presence of guilt in people's lives, as much as they try to get rid of it, the fact that that's there is different from the animals. Animals don't feel guilty about anything. We do because we know that we've done something wrong. And our lives are, are to be marked by holiness, or to be set apart for God for something special. We are stamped with the ownership of God upon us. So the next question is, what happened to that image? When we inherited Adam's sin, this image of God in the broad sense was marred, but it was not destroyed altogether. Our image-bearing capabilities are used for self and not for God. That image in the narrow sense, our knowledge, our righteousness, and our holiness was lost when we sinned. There is this steel curtain between us and God. We do not seek Him. We do not want Him. We are living for ourselves and our own little kingdom. And so in our sin, we do not treat one another as people made in God's image. Instead, we are careless, hurtful, judgmental, harsh, and abusive. Because we are made in the image of God, man can do great things. We can look for a cure for cancer. We can put men on the moon. But because we have fallen into sin, man can do horrible things. We can exterminate entire cities and sexually abuse children. The glory goes to God for the good things we do, not to ourselves. And the help for all that is wicked is found in God and not in ourselves. We're schizophrenic. We can do great things. We can do horrible things. We are a mess and we are magnificent. I'm a magnificent mess. And how is this image restored? That's the next question. Well, what we need is a transformation of our hearts. The New Testament tells us that when we become Christians, the image of God is restored. We become a new creation. Ephesians 4.24 says that in Christ, we bear again those marks of true righteousness and holiness after the image of him who created us. What was lost is now given to us. There is a desire for righteousness and holiness. Colossians 3.10 says that we are renewed in knowledge after the image of the creator. We want to know God. We want to know who we are. We want to know how we relate in his world. That knowledge, righteousness, and holiness which was lost is restored. When we come to Jesus by faith, we're given the ability to hunger for God to worship God, and to be a true reflection of His glory. And yet, in that redeemed state, we are not yet made perfect. We have to wait for that. We do not display this image perfectly. But if there is one place this image of God is to be celebrated and nurtured, it is in the church. Do we go after the healthy and the whole? and tend to ignore the broken and the hurting? 
This should not be. Our calling is to help each other in our quest for identity and in our struggle to find significance. And we should be helping messes become magnificent again in Jesus Christ. The church is a place to encourage each other and to love each other as image bearers of God. We need to see in each other a reflection of our Creator God. Who are you anyway? Remember I said last week that Moses wrote this when he was in the wilderness with the people of God. They had been taken out of Egypt. And I think Moses is trying to tell them, listen, you were, you were not made to be a slave. Part of, part of Moses' job was not just to get Israel out of Egypt, it was to get Egypt out of Israel. You were not made to be a slave, you were the crown of creation. In God's eyes, a pharaoh and a slave were made of the same stuff. And they're on equal terms before God as a masterpiece of God. If you do not see yourself as a son and daughter of God, as, as made by him with dignity and value, you are right where Satan wants you to be. Never let anyone rob you of your value and your dignity. Never rob yourself of the value and the dignity that God gave you when you were woven together in your mother's womb. A mother's womb is holy ground. And where any individual stands is a holy and a sacred place because it is an image of God and an image bearer of Him. Now where does this, where does this go in Genesis 1? It moves from this creation of God as an image bearer into this unique a mandate, this unique job, this, this purpose for why he put us here as his image bearers. It's the cultural mandate. We, we find out his will and we carry it out. It's not just the king who does it, it's us. I want to ask you the same three questions. What is it? What happened to it? And how do we get it back? Well, what is this cultural mandate? In verse 28, God pronounces a blessing over the man and the woman. God pronounces his favor. As image bearers, we are given the task of filling the earth and subduing it. This dominion begins in the beautiful garden home that God gave them. And we can only assume that if they stayed righteous, if they had not sinned, that garden would have been expanded outward and people would have spread outward. And, and the world itself, would be, the garden would grow because of what they were doing. God says to the crown of his creation, enjoy it, use it, take care of it. You are the kings and the queens of this domain. And remember, you were made by me. It is all good, but never forget that you are not God. I am. And so God gives his blessing. Why? Because we need the blessing of God's power and God's spirit in our life so that we can reproduce and also go in and subdue the earth. You're always under my rule and under my blessing. God is telling the man he has made. Well, what happened to the dominion? You see, with this place, this garden, comes a time of probation. While you are here, I give you everything in here to eat. Enjoy the fruit, eat of all the trees, except for one. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is off limits to you. On the day that you eat of it, you shall die. These are, do you see the opposites that come out in this chapter? Good and evil are opposites. Day and night, heaven and earth. Now, you see, eat of this tree, you will be thrust into a world of evil and death. There's this contrast between life and death now that's introduced. And that was, listen, that was where we, we in terms of the, of, of the, the seed of, Abraham, of Adam and Eve, that's where we went off the rails. Satan convinced them that the thing forbidden was the thing that they should want the most. 
As long as there was a tree off limits, it reminded them of their subjection to God. Tell a kid he can do anything except that one thing. Don't touch it. And what do we, what, what do they, do they want to do? <laughs> Go back and touch it. That was the tree that they hated, and that was the tree that they went after. They failed the test, even when they were told it would bring death upon them. Our hearts are so deceitful, we will, we will ignore the consequences as long as we can protect our own desires. That's how sin works. The cultural mandate was given before Adam and Eve fell into sin. So it is still in force today for, for everyone. Because of sin, our ability to exercise dominion has been badly marred. Listen, dominion, ruling properly over this world that, that is divorced from God's rule and control has turned to domination. We have abused the earth. We have raped and pillaged our natural resources. We have all but exterminated entire species of animals. Cultural pursuits have become opportunities for greed. If money is placed anywhere to make people's lives better, the wrong people will get a hold of it. In the quest to aid the poor, money and food are stolen by governments. Dominion for many people has led to the domination of entire countries and poverty for millions. It's a good idea, but it's flawed. The cultural mandate's got problems because we got problems, and it's called sin. But what's the answer? In Jesus Christ, we can return to a proper view of dominion. We can fill the earth with our children who will not be afraid to stand for Christ and turn the tide of immorality in our land. And we say, what kind of world are we giving to our kids? Look at it positively. What opportunities are there for our kids when they grow to be like Christ, to, to impart Christ-likeness into our culture and to, to overturn the bad influences of the fall? It's Christians that are leading the way in education, medical care, law, science, and ethics. It is Christians leading the way in industry and the arts and films and politics who are called to reclaim a broken world for Christ, to enter into our culture, to seek to transform it with the gospel. Never forget that is our overarching duty. The church is going back into the cities. There used to be a flight from the cities into the suburbs, and now there's been a trend back the other way. We've neglected the cities that are such great, great places for, for, for cultural expansion, and we're going back into the cities to reclaim them, to refurbish housing, to create jobs. Listen, dear Calvary members, we should never be afraid of our culture. We must enter into it and answer the questions that are being asked. For years and years in a quest to be holy, we have stayed away from worldly people and what worldly people do, lest we be tainted. And over the past decade, a new breed of Christians is reaching out to transform the culture. The church is now seeing the value of supporting agencies that are as concerned about deed ministries as they are about word ministry. The churches that have adjusted to their neighborhoods and are not afraid to get involved are the ones that are healthy and growing. Well, I must press on as we close the sermon. What's the, uh, what's the fulfillment of this? Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of both the image of God and the cultural mandate. Follow me now. Do not miss this. Why did God say to us in the commandment, do not make any carved image or any likeness of God in the Ten Commandments? Why did he say that? Is it because there can be no image that could possibly reflect who God is? No. God reserves the right to make the image of himself that he wants in order to bring us to faith. We were that 
image in our created glory, but we have marred that image and broken that image. Our sin keeps us from both living out the image of God and seeing the image in others. And what does God do? What does God do? He sends another man. He sends a perfect man. He sends the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says he is the image of the invisible God and the exact representation of his being. To see him is to see the Father. He is the image before whom all will bow one day. To see and know him is to see and know the Father. For you to be restored to the image of God, you must put your faith in the one who wants to put his image in you. Jesus is also the one who faithfully fulfills the cultural mandate. He never married, and so he never had any physical seed. But he is the savior of this world, and his spiritual seed is found in every nation, every tongue, every tribe and people. God blesses the man and the woman and tells them to be fruitful and multiply. Now this cultural mandate is still in force and it takes a new turn in the New Testament. He gives to us, his church, a job beyond the cultural mandate. It is not for the world, it is for us. Before ascending to heaven, Luke says that Jesus blessed his disciples just as God blessed the man and the woman in chapter 1. Matthew tells us what that blessing was. Go into all the world and make disciples. The, the disciples needed blessing in order to multiply spiritually. God gave his blessing, I am with you, now go forth. And Jesus Christ came to subdue the earth and to rule over it. Think of what he did in terms of a cultural mandate in three short years on earth. He enters into the darkness of sin and shows the light of the, the Father. He heals the blind. He heals the lame. He reveals his complete authority over the forces of nature and over the powers of evil. He is the king, I tell you, and he's now reigning in heaven, and he will reign until he makes all his enemies a footstool for his feet. Where are you in this, dear brothers and sisters? He is the king who subdues this world, and he is the king who subdues your heart. And if you don't know him, turn to him in repentance and in faith, that you would be stamped again with that image of God, that you would reflect his glory, and that you would go in the power and strength and blessing of Jesus Christ. You may not be able to affect big changes in this world, but right where he has sent you, you can fulfill his purpose and live for him. You ready to do that? Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came as the image of God and that as we come to you, we reflect more and more your image and your likeness. For as we come into you, you make us more like you. And this is what we want. And Father, if there are those here who are feeling bullied, ignored, distraught over bad choices they've made, feeling as if they don't belong, what would you give to them another look at how they were made in the secret places in their mother's womb? That they were made with dignity and with value. That they are creatures made by you. And would they come back to the power of the cross, to the power of creation's glory, embrace Christ and see themselves and see others as the crown of creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.